coming to my home. It's such a, a privilege and pleasure to welcome you to Sun Valley and to be standing here at, at this on this stage to this incredibly smart group of people and tell you my story. I'm, I'm, and to be interviewed by Robert is awesome. So I, I just want to give you some context. When I first, uh, this talk is um, titled The Five Pillars of a Startup. And if you know anything about me, it's hard to put me in a box and give me five things to talk about because I'll talk about 20. But that's why Robert's going to try to keep me guided here. But I just want to start by saying when I first started Scotty Best, my idea of success didn't look anything like the reality. And the reality turned out so much better. But it was a long and windy path to get here. And I would encourage every entrepreneur out there to, to, to know that there is a different path than what Silicon Valley would tell you is a startup success. When I started, I worked for a major law firm, and I thought that success was about raising, you know, first round of angel funding and then another funding and then not making any money but having these ridiculous valuations and, and within two years, you know, being $100 million. And the, the other company that's sort of similar to mine is a, a company, Bonobos, who's sold more stock than they have clothing. Um, they, they would have been better off turning to each of their investors and selling, selling clothing. They would have made more money. So you know what I've done is is done it kind of the old-fashioned way. You know, I, I I started slow and I built a brand. And, and when I started, I didn't realize it at the time I was the first apparel brand to start on the internet. So the things I've learned along the way is that you know greatness takes time. It's been 14 years to achieve what I've achieved, and I love living here in Sun Valley and doing what I want. And we have no investors. I made a choice at the very beginning whether to raise money or you know, borrow against my house. And um, so it's a long and winding path. Each of you got my book. I'm not gonna go into the whole biography of it all, but it's entertaining the book. And first and foremost, it's a story. It's not like here are the three things you gotta do. So on your flight home, wherever you're going, start reading it. I guarantee you're gonna pull well, it in. I picked five things out to sort of keep on the pillar thing. And I'm gonna read from the book and then have you just talk. So the first thing is know your customers. It's a business cliche to say know your customers, but when I say it, I mean to literally know your customers. At least know their names. It doesn't matter if you're a small business or a large business. Some of your best opportunities will slip by you if you don't know your customers. Any customer can be an influencer and you might not even realize it. Expound on that. So, you know, basically I used the model, the internet to, to basically recreate that experience uh, remember Sam the Butcher in the Brady Bunch? Yeah. You, you might not have liked him, but you knew him and you trusted him and you gave him your money and you know, Alice liked him apparently. So, <laughs> but, I, mean, I, I utilize the tools of the internet, video, to give customers a, a sense that they actually know me and I go out of my way to get to know them. I travel all around the country and do these fan events. I don't care if two people show up or 40, I want to learn from them and I want to be sincere in, in learning to become better. Every single time I meet a customer, I ask them the same question, how can I do better? And I listen to them and if they tell me something I hadn't heard before, I, I, I make a voice memo and I send it to my team and I really try to impact it. So because we were the first brand, uh, apparel brand, to start on the internet, I viewed it as a unique opportunity to create this relationship with my customer so that they feel that they know me and I feel that they know them and I actually do. And on my Facebook page, you know, I'd encourage you, I'm not that active on Twitter, although that's my handle, but please friend me on Facebook and, and you'll see that I'm very transparent in all that I do. So I have friends. What's that? You got 5,000 friends. I, I know, I, I'm pruning a little bit. I got 4,900, so <laughs> don't follow me. So um, yeah, know your customers, it's really, really important. 
the second thing was uh, uh, the Scott OS corporate culture. You know me as a passionate personal promoter, but here is a concentrated dose of how I approach running my business with the same philosophy and drive that I approach, apply to promoting it. If you want to be successful, you can't have one without the other. We define corporate culture as what we do consistently as individuals and as a group to further the goals of the organization. Bottom line, the mindset, expectations, and requirements apply equally to everyone connected to the company. It's an all or nothing undertaking. And this is probably why you have earned yourself a, a sum of a reputation in town. People either really love you and think you're a genius or they think you're an asshole, right? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about the corporate culture and, and how you've uh, uh, built it and, and why you're so direct and why you're a little bit like Steve Jobs in that regard. Well, well um, so you hear all about this when you're starting a business, you know, you, you gotta focus on the corporate culture. You read every book and, and frankly, I ignored it for five years, the first five years of my business. It just didn't seem important enough. I didn't have enough people. I was too busy doing everything I was doing. And, and then we started doubling our business. Our business doubled year over year for a couple of years. And I listened to all the conventional wisdom that says you need a, a, a more senior experienced manager to run your business. So I hired one and expected him to just take my business off to the next level. What I later learned quickly, after he got drunk at you know a couple of my uh, events and treated my employees poorly, that no, the, the, the job of the CEO, the founder, is to establish the culture, make it clear so that people know what they're getting into. So you know, we sat down with we, my wife and myself, and my key other key employee, Thomas O'Leary, who's a man's this day a close friend of mine, uh, and involved in my business, and define our corporate culture, and we defined it not a, a, as to what necessarily we <coughs> wanted it to be, but around the, the, the attributes that were important to me. Honesty, integrity, and transparency. Hit. Those are so important. Anyone who knows me, you can say a lot of things about me, but I am authentic. I mean, you ask me any question, and we're gonna give you an opportunity to ask me a question. I'm gonna answer it with no bullshit. I, I just, I'm not wired to do that. So I expect the same of all of my employees and, um, and, and I, I give the same to my customers as well. That same honesty, integrity, and transparency. So we have five things. I'm not gonna go into the whole corporate culture because I could talk for hours on the importance of it and you never stop working on it. You have to reiterate it all the time. But also what's important to me as a part of the corporate culture is speed. You know, I think that whatever is worth doing is worth doing fast. It enables you to think about something and then move on, finish it, and move on to the next thing. As an example of that, you have this new uh, Pocket Man mobile in your house. How long did that take to build? Well, you know, because of this party, you know, and everyone's coming to my house, I saw this great opportunity for this beautiful stairwell, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to, to have this Pocket Mobile, and not my car, but the, a mobile, and uh, eight days ago, eight days ago, literally, <coughs> I came up with the idea. I worked with a SketchUp artist, and uh, who you know, gets in Google and, or what used to be Google. And, and eight days ago, it was an idea and now it's not. I mean, everything I do is quick. As uh, you know, our, our building, we built, we fired our architect and had a great uh, builder whose wife is here, some big current somewhere. Um, and, and 11 months later, we, we completed, ripped the ceiling off our, our, our whole building and built the building and designed all the unique features there. Everything worth doing is worth doing fast. In my opinion. Yeah. Uh, when I talk to other entrepreneurs, it's number one on the list about culture. They all mention it. But you talked about capital and, and your approach to uh, uh, taking capital. I want to read from your book and then we'll get into it. You say, focus on making money. And the quote is, I'm in business to make money, period. I don't care if venture capitalists don't look at profitability as a key metric. I don't care if Mark Cuban says a thousand times that the only way to start a business is with other people's <coughs> money. And I don't care if that makes me look or sound unsophisticated in some circles. Uh, unpack a little bit more on, on how you how you really did get this business going to a place where it's a million, multi-million dollar business. You know, uh, when I first started, you know, when you start a business, the thought is you gotta raise money, you have to raise money. So I looked at all, I just, it was conventional wisdom. You needed other people's money to start your business. And I looked at all the opportunities and what it would take to raise money. And, and it took time. And when you're starting a business, what you need is time. 
and, and the time that you're spending going out and pitching your business to everyone else is time you can't spend building your business. Mm -hmm. And I looked at all the different options and, and I had a lot of people who offered me money, even to this day, I, you know, people are offering me money for my business. And I weighed out you know, taking other people's money and having to report back to them on a monthly or quarterly basis, or mortgaging my home, taking a second mortgage of my home, taking every penny I could I, I could invest in, and all my savings and putting it in. And, and then I got skin in the game too. And fortunately, we live in a country, I, I, obviously you have skin in the game too, but for any business, but we live in a country that the worst thing that can happen to you is you go bankrupt. It's almost a sign of pride, it seems, for a lot of people to go bankrupt. Failing is learning. So I, I, I looked at it and said, I can fail, and I, I'm not gonna go to jail. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that as an option, I, it, but at the same time, it drove me. I write in the book that I paint myself into corners, and, it, and by doing so, it forces me to work harder, to know that the alternative, in my case, is that if I fail, I'm not gonna go to jail, I'm gonna go bankrupt, and I'm gonna have to, God forbid, practice law again. <laughs> which I hated more than anything else. And, and so that, that drove me. So I would encourage you to start a business. There are lots of businesses that you can start, mostly service businesses, that don't require a lot of capital. You know, think about you know, the, the trade-off between all the time and energy you're gonna spend raising money, pitching investors, keeping them informed, dealing with their interest, and I can tell you, if I, had, if I had investors, would, would they have allowed me to buy this crazy vehicle that you saw in the video and, and, and allowed me to build this palatial home and do all these things? No, they would have wanted, and they would have been right because it's their money. But now I control, I have, I have complete control over my life as a result of, of making that initial capital decision. And in fact, you know, uh, one of the best pieces of advice, I hired this guy as a consultant, Barry Moltz, who's a, a pretty well-known you know, business consultant, to come in, this was right after 9-11, just right after my business started, and like everyone else's business, it, it fell off, and I was gonna raise money, I was scared to death, and he said, you don't need to raise money, it was the best piece of advice I've ever gotten, I thank that guy so many times, because if, I, if he had turned to me and said, you know, dude, I wanna invest, and I, uh, it would, it, I'd have a much very different life uh, than I do right now. So, fourth thing is use technology. Apple, Google, Microsoft, massive companies who develop products that entertain and inform, but ultimately provide tools for personal productivity. With the billions of dollars that flow through them in every tech-based VC-funded startup in Silicon Valley in New York, why on earth would I not use every technology advantage, technological advantage I can find? Yeah. It, it basically it's back to that story with the, the butcher and, and the communication. The, commu the, the technology tools available, you know, from uh, you know, I use video uh, emails. You send someone a video email, they are going to watch it. I, it's funny. I, I I forgot one of the speakers was talking about the, the communication is only ten percent of what's written. It's ninety percent of the tone and the body movements. And and when I give people a video message, they cost me nothing to do. They're gonna read it, they're gonna to listen to it, it's gonna be the first video message they ever get. So I use that technology, I use, I use Google Documents, I use Gmail, I use all this technology, and it's enabled me to basically run my business from Sun Valley, never once having gone to China <coughs> to visit my factory. That's unheard of for an apparel maker. In 15 years, we've never been to, been to my factories because we utilize, I create a video, I show them the pocket, I, I, I use sketches, I, you know, I, I have Skype calls with them, I, I, I find ways to use all this wonderful technology without, that's free. And, and a lot of people don't do it. Another thing about, people think that you need to be in person to do business, you know, for the first, 12 years of my business, I, I refuse to do any business in person. I think you can get more done if you, if you train people how you'd like to do business in bullet point format of what the action items are. Now there is a lot to be said for doing business in person, but the, it's a risk reward. I can do 12 more things rather than flying, especially how difficult it is to fly from here and go someplace. So I utilize this common technology extensively. And one of the things I've tried to do, I make business a game. I treat every interaction as though it's a balloon 
that I hit it up in the air, and, and I see how, how high I can hit it by how many steps clearly I can put in bullet points. Here are the five things I need, here are the dates I need it by, and I flag that email. I, one of the keys to my success is what I call FU, follow up. I follow up on every email I ever send or receive until its natural conclusion. So I flag that email for three days from now, so that balloons up in the air, and I got another one, and another one, and my wife and I have a game. How many threads of email can we have running at any particular time? And if that email doesn't come down before my follow-up notice, I ping that person, I just like status. And that's what's enabled me to build this business. We have 14 people. It's ridiculous. For what we built with 14 full-time people, um, SkyMall, by comparison, had 135 people before they went bankrupt. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, do more with less <coughs> using technology. Embrace it. Yeah, the last thing was passion. And uh, you write, TV host Chris Hardwick might be thought of by some people as the king of nerds. And he summed it up beautifully on the Jimmy Fallon show last year when he said, um, it's not what you, what you like that makes someone a nerd. I think it's how intensely and passionate, passionately you like those things. A nerd's superpower is to understand something more than any other living creature on the planet, and then shame them, shame them with that knowledge. <laughs> you were uh, talking to me while we were walking around Silicon Valley about zippers. You know more about zippers than anybody else I've ever met. I know more about pockets. I mean, that's pretty, well, I that's mean, a they, given, right? Well, uh, you know, zippers go with pockets. Yeah. They do. <laughs> you know, once you realize that you set, as the entrepreneur, a founder of your business, you set the high watermark for passion. And, and don't expect anyone to be more passionate about your business than you are. Take that in for a second. I mean, seriously, I mean, if you have a bad day, you still have to come to the office more passionate than anyone else. You're allowed to have bad days, and, and part of being honest in, in your, and being transparent, when I'm having a bad day, I say it, but I'm still passionate about what I'm doing. And I exude that passion. Passion is almost contagious, you know, I, I have found. You know, uh, people want to be around passionate people and, and passion breeds more passion. So my, my, my customers are, are, are my fans. I mean, Robert was first a customer, now every day wears, wears everything that I have. So, so know this, it's so cliche, you know, to be passionate about what you're doing, but live it, breathe it, and understand that if, if you, you are the high watermark for the passion that you bring. And it's not just about your product, it's about your company, about your brand, it's about everything. And bring that passion to everything that you do, because the moment you lose that passion, you're, 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 you're gonna fail. I mean, I really, it's time to start looking for an exit. And that's another thing I wanna talk about. The, you know, we're on to the sixth and seventh and tenth pillar of, yeah. of the startup. And, you know, you know, when I started, everyone asked me, well, what's your exit strategy? I mean, you got it. What's your business plan and your exit strategy? I never had a business plan when I started. Ne never did. Never had a financials, never never did anything. I, I, I looked at every dollar I spent as, I'm gonna add on where that dollar goes and how it's gonna do. But, I, I, it seems so contrary to start a business wondering how I'm going to exit it. You cannot be passionate you know, throughout the entire course of your business if all you're thinking about is the day you're going to leave. I mean, it's like thinking of a marriage as to what's your exit plan. I mean, <laughs> you, know, you know, I know it makes sense. You know, I get it, but you know, I, I didn't do it. And, and, I, and I think part of the, my success, as Robert alluded to at the beginning, is Laura. I mean, she is awesome. I mean, she works so hard. I, and so uncommon for a couple to work so well together. And, and she, she, what she says is, I make shit happen, she gets shit done. <laughs> so, she goes to the office at one o'clock, 1 a.m. every morning. One of the reasons why we moved our home above our office is to change our otherwise four minute commute to 30 seconds. <laughs> we, measure, we measure efficiency in seconds in what we do. And for that reason, you know, I, I'm a little much in this little small mountain town. If, every, if I'm measuring every second is I can get something else done, I don't have time to talk about the weather. 
So, and, and that, that makes it difficult, so. Yeah. Does anyone have any butt wax? First of all, talk about SkyMall. Oh. You're buying SkyMall? What's going on with SkyMall? All right, so this is exciting. Um, about six weeks ago, on the news, they said, um, oh, well, well yeah. all right, we, okay, so, we're breaking news. All right, um, seriously, six weeks ago on the news, you might recall, they said SkyMall's going bankrupt. And the reason why it was going bankrupt is that it, 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 it was doomed to failure. For one reason, they said there are too many other distractions in the plane. Uh, you have your iPad, your Kindle, and all these other things. And I thought to myself, well, I continue to fly, and I keep picking up that silly magazine because I crave that interaction with paper because I, I don't have it anymore. And I, just, I thought that it failed for different reasons. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, and, and everyone I've talked to, and they were quoted as, oh, it's done, it has to be done. So what I did was, that was on Friday. Over the course of the weekend, talking to my wife, and Laura, you know, we, we, we thought that there was a real opportunity, and because we were an advertiser in Sky Mall, we decided to make a play for it. Now, here's something that's really interesting. The internet levels the playing field. So all, to make a play for it, what does that mean? I issued a press release, not on Monday because there was gonna be a massive storm and I, I thought it through that, that everyone was talking about this storm that was supposed to close the world down or the whole East Coast. On Tuesday, I issued a press release, wrote a, a, an article, talked to some of my uh, media friends, and ever since then, six weeks ago, I am the presumptive buyer of SkyMall. <laughs> By just getting out there and, and talking about it and saying the story. So. Uh, tomorrow is the, the auction for SkyMall um, in bankruptcy court, bids are due. And I looked at all the uh, due diligence materials and I discovered one thing. They didn't have any airline contracts. They had all expired. I'm not gonna pay millions of dollars basically for the name SkyMall. So what do I do? I'm starting sky to buy It's a new company. They deserve competition. You're hearing it first. Right? <laughs> By June, our goal is to have not necessarily a, a separate magazine, but we're going to work with all the airlines to incorporate a 16-page initial supplement at the back of every every airline magazine that's already in there with a really unique rub. Instead of having all these kitschy little stupid things that you, you never really want, we're having only travel-related um, gadgets and accessories and, and apps. It's going to change every single month. Like and, multi packs and Yeah, like multi-packs. And you know, I was talking to Logitech. They have Bluetooth speakers, and and of course, Scotty Vest. And you know, I'm going to. It's going to be spoken in one voice. You know, me as a kind of the Jay Peterman of it all. You know, you know, telling all the but here's the unique thing. How many of you remember when duty free used to sort of mean something? Duty free stores get excited to go to the airport to save on the taxes. Well, our deal is this. You can only make a purchase when you're physically at an airport for 24 hours thereafter. We're gonna geotag you, you're gonna have access to a website, and then you're gonna get a significant incentive to buy products within that 24 hour period. You're gonna buy them not through Sky Mall or Sky to Buy, you're gonna buy them from the ultimate resale. So, you know, if Logitech and I work out a deal, you will actually land in Logitech's website. So they own the customer. It's really, and we'll get affiliate fees and work all that stuff out in the back, the back and we'll have a portal, but it's, it's really taking out the middleman and bringing Sky Mall, you know, you know to Sky Dubai, your new mall in the sky, they're gonna get really pissed when they see this. <laughs> <laughs> because someone's paying a lot of money for nothing. I mean, you know, so this is just competition, but it basically was a, a, an opportunity that I saw and recognized that I can make it happen by thinking it through and then and then telling people I'm gonna do it, and then guess what, do it. So, so few people do their homework. <laughs> Even though I'm not on Twitter, so I'm on Twitter right? they have not even looked at my Twitter account and thought it through. It's true. I think that's true. We gotta know what the So uh, we have four minutes left, or about there. If there's a question, we're gonna take questions. Maybe you want to walk around. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. And you said that um, you built your business out of desperation, and earlier you said that you paint yourself into corners. And I found that it's really easy to hustle if all you're eating is top ramen, but it's a lot harder when you're eating ah. So how do you maintain paying yourself in the corners and how do you stay hungry? 
when some of the pressure is off? You know, um, that's a really good question. What's the question? Yeah. The question is, is how do you stay hungry once you achieve some level of success? You know, I, don't, I, I mean, I don't know. I think it's just I keep wanting to do more. I, I mean, I'm not bored at all. It's more like I just want to. I keep wanting. I'm like the ever ready, ready, ready bunny. I just want to move forward. And now, once you achieve <coughs> success, you don't want to fail. You know, and, and I just want to keep moving forward. I don't know, I, I, and I know that I could. The moment I stop, because what I attribute my success to is, is that I keep moving forward and keep wanting to do more, do the SkyMall thing, come out with new products and new partnerships. Because I, I fear that the day I stop doing that, the day I get lazy, you know, the, the, the day I accept mediocrity is the day I become mediocre. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just a mind frame, I guess, so. Chris Voss. What's the advantages and uh, uh, things that you've learned in sitting in a hot tub with Robert Scoble half naked? <laughs> First thing, let me, let me I assume that. you're half naked. Half naked, it's completely naked. <laughs> um, you, know, no, I, you know, it's I, honestly, this is about building relationships. Robert and I became friends, you know, uh, you know, really close friends about three years ago, and you and I uh, about the same time period. and. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just building these relationships is so important, and I built them with so many of you here, and I look forward to continuing that. You know, by uh, you letting people your uh, Blair slingshot, which is called the pocket right? Yeah. Uh, you're taking some risk. I mean, I could have wrapped up that around the tree, and uh, then you know, Marion would have sued you, or at least been mad at you, or maybe happy. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it takes some risk. Businesses usually don't take that kind of risk with influence. No way, man. It's, but it's lower risk for him. Even if you wrap it around, he's leveraging off your brand. I know that. So, so but you can, so wrap few the, you can wrap it around the tree, and he'll still get good news out of it. Scott <laughs> <laughs> Jordan kills Robert Scoble. That's true. But so few people do this kind of influencer marketing. Tina Gilmore said, man, it just makes me so happy. And it builds an emotional. Yeah, no, I, 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 loan, I loan my vehicle to, to complete strangers. You know, my, my vehicle winters in, in California, and I loan it to complete strangers, knowing that they're, they're going to think fondly of me. They're going to tweet about and talk about it. And yes, if something happened to you, you know, it would have been newsworthy, Scott. You know, we saw. Because my wife said, I, I actually used to race cars when I lived in Chicago, and as I go around turns, you know, she would say to me, just remember something as you're going around you know, at the end of the straightaway at 150 miles an hour. Dead, not mangled. She did not want me to come home. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, uh, that's go for it. <laughs> I've got 15 seconds left. I, I, I don't know who I'm supposed to say. Scott, a fitting consolation. A friend of mine asked me in Seattle if the Scott Vest zip neck shirt was the only one I had. <laughs> nice. Uh, I nice. Every day. I appreciate it's it. Great. It's a great product. Uh, my goal is to get you know all the techie influencers, all of you, to wear one of my products every day. Because it's, it's paradigm shifting. You know, once you realize you have pockets to put your stuff in, I, I want to be. I want to be. Uh, we're we're going to get off the stage. One thing. What are we doing in July? Oh, so you're, the Allen Company comes here. I, I know you're familiar. It's like a billionaire uh, summit every July, and uh, Robert and I are going to be throwing something called Press Dex where we're inviting the media who is shunned from this event to come to my house at, with Robert as an opportunity to hang out. And then we're gonna invite the billionaires, if they have news to break, to come to my house at this event. So if you're in here in July, come hang with us and we're gonna do some fun things. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you.